Now, there are two or three ways to do it. One would be to, to do the thing that so often we do on a college campus when uh, we have a person that we've known as well as we have Bob over a long period of years, and many of you have known him many more years than I well say, well, you, he doesn't need any introduction because you know him, and then sit down. And uh, I'm not going to do that. I could go on into the second stage and say that Dr. LaFollette is one of a group of people who have been at Ball State Teachers College many, many years. And all of the things that I've just been telling you about the expansion to date and in the future is based on the foundation that these people have built. And then I could go on and enlarge upon that. Then I could sit down. I want to give the... I want to do this one tonight just the same as if we had brought someone in from the outside and we were going to tell, you know, the long, long pedigree. And this, this is what I have. I think it's a very interesting kind of story. And I'm going to give it just as if Bob wasn't someone that all of you know better than uh, you would know someone from the outside. Bob, uh, Dr. Robert LaFollette received a bachelor's degree from Indiana State Teachers College in 1916 and a master's degree from the University of Wisconsin. He was an Austin scholar at Harvard University in 2324 and finished a doctor's degree at George Washington University in 1931. In the area of the languages, he speaks, reads, and writes German, he reads and writes French, and he reads and both Spanish and Dutch. His experience, he started in, his, in the grade school, and then he was a principal, and then he was in the United States Army in 18 and 19. He was the head of the history department in Brazil High School before he came here as the assistant professor of history at Ball State Teachers College in 1921. That's up till 1961. He's administrator of the Social Science Department at Ball State Teachers College, now with 25 professors, a secretary, two graduate assistants, 25 student assistants, 899 majors, and 3,000 students in regular classes in the Social Studies Division Department. Well, he's directed graduate study and theses for both the, the master's degree and the PhD degree. He's been a visiting professor at the University of Tampa, at the Freisberg and Straubling State Teachers College in Bavaria, Germany. I probably haven't pronounced it exactly as he would in German. And at Oldenburg Pedagogical University, also in German. He was a visiting expert in teacher education and social science the, for the United States uh, Secretary of the Army in Bavaria, in Germany. He was a social studies specialist in the International Social Studies Workshop at Heidelberg in 1950. He was the educational advisor to the office of the U.S. High Commissioner in Germany in the years 50 to 52. He was chairman of the American German Historian and History Teachers Workshop in Germany in 52. Social Studies Specialist to the North Rhine Westphalia Ministry from 54 to 55. Fulbright Lecturer in Germany in 56, 57. He's done a special research completed on the status of the political education and democracy in Germany today. A long list of publications beginning with the biography of James Swan, the National Dictionary of American Biography, short biographies of the men that he teaches about, Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, James Madison, Rutherford Hayes. I think I can read the next one, the Americaner Building Era Liebesfrom, 1953, in the byproducts, entitled Byproducts of the Depression in the World Digest. Spotlights on Uncle Sam in 1959, you want to see that one. The advisory editor of the 1954 yearbook of the National Council for Social Studies, the editor of the Indiana Social Studies Quarterly, and a contributor to a whole series of different men. He's also had membership in, I won't go into all of them, the ones that you know about, and so does he, and so do I. Honors, just as you'd expect, both at the undergraduate and the graduate level at Harvard and Columbia in addition. He appears in Who's Who in America, The American Men of Science, the presidents and professors in American universities, the leaders in education, who's who in the Midwest, who knows and what, and who's who in American education. This is Dr. Robert LaFollet, a member of our faculty these many years. Bob, this is yours. President Emmons, President Sidler, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, uh, fellow students. I feel quite naked and exposed <laughs> <laughs> as I began uh, to talk with you tonight on the subject of the international dimension. I was about to address you as 
fellow alumni, for I figure that I am just about to qualify with the end of the commencement uh, tomorrow. That's a very short moment, and we know now that time does not fly its jets instead. As alumni, most of you probably will remember that the Easterner was the forerunner of the Ball State News, our present college paper. If you were to peruse the October 21st, 1925 issue of the Easterner, you would find the head of the social science department quoted as saying, let us use the war debt to pay the expenses of teachers to go to Europe where they may come to a better appreciation of Europe and perhaps catch a world vision. Since that time, that individual has tried to join precept and practice uh, to a certain degree. And tonight I am sharing, want to share with you some thoughts on the international uh, dimension. May I try to make clear my idea of the international dimension first by indicating perhaps what it is not. It has nothing to do, as I conceive it, with interplanetary space relations. Perhaps I can illustrate it through a letter that I received from a German friend of mine on May the 5th, 1961. It was written on the first day of May and arrived at my desk on the fifth day of May. You may recall that that's the day that may go down in American history as American Aeronaut Day. The astronaut flight of Shepard took place on that date. In the last paragraph of that letter, my German friend says, Es interessiert mich nicht, wann die erste Menschen die Welt Raumfahrt antreten oder wann sie auf dem Mond landen. Mich interessiert es, dass Frieden bleibt und dass wir in Frieden leben können und frei bleiben. Trotz Astronauten und Mondfahrer wird auf Erden weiter mit Wasser gekocht werden. I am not very interested when the first world space flight will be accomplished. What interests me is that peace remains and that we can live in peace and remain free. In spite of the astronauts and the moon travelers, upon the earth we will still continue to cook with water. Is he not saying that we may take flight into space, but we are fated to return to the earth and live here together? The challenge to us is to get over more inner space, the inner space in the minds and hearts of men. Our challenge is in the area of human relations. That the test of man may well be whether he can get along with his neighbors here on earth. Confucius is reported as saying that if you have one year, plant rice. Ten years, plant trees. If a hundred years, educate men. The developments are sometimes so sharp that we wonder if we have that long term. The winds of change are blowing across the world. Empires are exploding and breaking up. 
But doesn't this make the international dimension a categorical imperative? The international dimension, as I'm conceiving it, has the qualities of depth, of width, of length, and of height itself. It has depth in terms of the roots of understanding of people and of nations. It has length in that it projects into the past and forward into the future. Many, most of our present students, perhaps all of them, will know the year 2000 and beyond. It has the width of the equator that encircles the globe, and it has height in attaining to the plane of the spiritual, to the brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God. God is the original and foremost internationalist. And we have the international dimension finding expression in the Colombo Plan, in the Point Four Program, in the Peace Corps, and in the activities of the American Friends Service Committee. The international dimension, uh, dimension is viewed as the growing edge, the growing edge of education. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the peoples had their world transformed by the great voyages of discovery. We are discovering new worlds too. The emergence of the international society is a major fact of our era, and it cannot be ignored. It is the growing edge for the Pacific Islands inter as factors in our daily thinking, and Africa, once known as dark and unknown, now stands out in bold relief in the noonday sun. People, highly diverse peoples, with very different heritage, heritages, are being forced to live together. Our orientation is no longer toward Europe alone, but toward all mankind. Yet many are getting a 19th century education for a 20th century world. Nostalgia will not enable any of us to go back to those simple serene times of an uncomplicated era when we watch the drift of seasons as our tiny segment of the world passed by. We have the jet propulsion of our airplanes. We have the submarines and the ships powered by atomic energy. News pictures are flashed in moments around the world. Only 150 go years ago, less than 150 years ago, Andrew Jackson won the Battle of New Orleans 15 days after the war was supposed to be over the Treaty of Gaunt in Belgium. News then traveled with the speed of a sailing vessel. And yet it does seem that our physical horizons have expanded faster than our wisdom. By the international dimension, we mean the education of teachers with world horizons for world-centered education with world perspective. With world perspective, we can be more stable and calm. We can realize that the domestic and the foreign are but parts of a single whole, and we can strive to make whole men, whole in competence and conscience, who have convictions and are ready to try to get something done. Men whose hearts are warm enough to melt a cold war and whose minds are clear enough to prevent a hot one. This is something of what one person understands by international dimension. Believe that the implementation of the idea is both central and crucial. The most skillfully thrown pass in a football game 
is no good unless it's caught. And how good it is depends on what the carrier, the, the one who catches the ball, does with it. And we dare not make the mistake. The interpolation of the international dimension is an opportunity and an obligation of all of us educators. And I'm speaking to you tonight, not as a general audience, but as people who've had the privilege of a college education. I'm speaking to you as scholars, as educators and teachers. And we know of the universality of the search of truth. We believe that the, semi the dissemination of truth makes a difference. We believe that free intellectual inquiry can offset narrow nationalism and the things that tend to divide the world. Not that we want education to produce uniformity, but rather a tolerance for diversity. And the community of scholars represents the interdependence of nations. It elicits the cooperation and commands the loyalties of scholars who work across institutional lines and national boundaries. We try to increase the space, the room, where nations can stand with dignity and honor. Of course, it takes time, it takes thought, it takes patience to come to understand common values, to get full communication across cultural boundaries. But we must link the peoples, regardless of their wide, their wide diversities, into the international community. Through the assistance of anthropology, sociology, and related disciplines, we can get a deeper appreciation of cultural diversity, and we can avoid the perpetuation of stereotypes. The understanding of cultures other than our own is imperative for sound appraisals and wise decisions by the general public as well as by the leaders. How may we do this implementation? How shall we get it done? I would like to run the risk of being somewhat specific. I think one thing that we can do is to use the courses in world history and world civilization to supply the framework for students' international perspective. But in these courses, we must get rid of Western parochialism. We must establish communication between the West and the non-West. This is greatly needed as a tool in wedging a preventive peace. A second thing that I believe would help is an increase in international relations courses, in area studies, and in college-wide institutes. Three of my colleagues, Wires, Farrell, and Scruton, are planning such an institute to be launched in the summer of 62 and to continue uh, thereafter. A third thing that we can do, and I think we must do, is we must do with citizenship education and with correct English usage, is to have it pervade the whole curriculum. We need to draw up a global curriculum that includes courses in non-Western languages, in history, in literature, in philosophy. These things are not luxuries today. They are necessities. There must be a greater emphasis upon languages other than English upon the foreign languages as tools. And those who teach the languages must bring vividly to their students pictures of the societies of the peoples who speak those languages. The function of culture and humanism is to increase the communication of man to man. A fourth thing that we can do is to have training programs for people to serve overseas. Today there are 500,000 Americans working abroad. In 1970, there will be no fewer than 2 million. And we need 
train people of thought and perception who care and who try to find ways for peace. The international civil service is an opportunity almost unlimited in its variety, in its horizon, and its challenge. I think another thing that, that we can do is to establish area studies on college campuses in America that correspond to area study groups abroad and have interrelations beneficially, mutually helpful as, as between these. I believe that we need to continue our exchanges, but we need more Sweetbriar junior year programs, more Antioch work abroad, more Stanford University study projects is the one near Stuttgart and the new one in Italy now. We need more study abroad. And when I say study abroad, as far as one person is concerned, I don't mean just Europe. I mean Asia. I mean Latin America. I mean uh, Africa. These studies years of study abroad are very rewarding to the highly proficient and seriously motivated. Any course that is simply an extension of sightseeing and touristing is indefensible. These are some of the ideas. I, I'm sure that you think of many more. But the idea of the international dimension must be implemented. In the 20th century, it is imperative that any respectable liberal education has a strong international component pervading it. World affairs are our affairs, and our affairs are those of the world. But we dare not end up with a national or western egocentric in a world that is demanding helocentric thinking. The world does not revolve around the West in this present contemporary society, society of global complexity. And yet our children are having their life space expanded more and more as they have the various peoples virtually sitting at their feet. We cannot educate them for the 20th century, for tomorrow, with the methods and ideas of yesterday. It is necessary that we, amid all of the thrashing psychological, economic, and social forces, educate for the world that is struggling to be born rather than the world that is dying. This is our challenge and this is our opportunity on behalf of peace, of security, of happiness, of dignity, of free men in a democratic world. Thank you very much.